My name is Valerie Cotton from the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, representing the entire Trans NIH Kids First Working Group today. And let me start off by telling you just a bit about how Kids First got started. The program was initiated in response to the 2014 Gabriella Miller Kids First Research Act, which transferred $126 million from a presidential nominating convention fund to a pediatric research initiative fund and authorized the appropriation of $12.6 million per year for 10 years to the NIH Common Fund. The first appropriation was in 2015, and we are partway through 2021, which is the seventh year of the program. Gabriella Miller, the bill and the program's namesake, was a 10-year-old advocate for pediatric research who lost her battle with a rare and inoperable form of pediatric brain cancer called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG, just six months before the bill was signed. The vision of the program is to alleviate suffering from childhood cancer and structural birth defects by fostering collaborative research to uncover the etiology of these diseases and by supporting data sharing within the pediatric research community. And through our public webinars, including today's webinar, you can see how collaboration and data sharing are accelerating pediatric research and setting the stage for improved diagnostics and therapeutics for patients and their families impacted by these conditions. Childhood cancers and structural birth defects have profound lifelong effects on children and their families, and several publications have revealed associations between childhood cancers and birth defects, suggesting that there are shared genetic pathways underlying these conditions. But since individual childhood cancers and structural birth defects tend to be relatively rare, there's a clear need for coordinated efforts to build, combine, and study sufficiently powered data sets. This is why in the first phase of the program, we focus on whole genome sequencing, cohorts of children affected by, the, by childhood cancer, structural birth defects, or both, because as highlighted in the last slide, many of these children are unfortunately affected by multiple conditions. We've also been developing the Kids First data resource to facilitate and empower analyses of these data sets and share the data with a wider research community to engage as many researchers as possible in understanding these conditions. To date, 40 childhood cancer and structural birth effects cohorts have been sequenced or are somewhere in the sequencing pipeline, and 19 data sets are accessible to the research community through the data resource. This means that nearly half of all Kids First data are accessible to the public. The Kids First data resource is a cloud-based platform made up of multiple tools designed to empower and accelerate collaborative pediatric research, not only with Kids First data sets, but to enable researchers to co-analyze Kids First data with other pediatric data sets through interoperability, broad data sharing, and collaboration. The data resource portal is the primary entry point to the data resource, and this is where researchers and other members of the public can visualize the data and search to discover which data sets they want to learn more about or analyze based on their scientific questions. If you haven't used the portal before, let me just explain a bit about how, how it works. Once you're in the portal, you can search for terms you're interested in and assemble a cohort made up of multiple data sets. For example, you could build a combined cohort of children affected with congenital heart disease and neuroblastoma. Then you can filter down which types of data files you're interested in analyzing. For individual level genomic data, you will have to obtain dbGaP approval before accessing those data sets. But once you do, you can push the data into a private cloud-based workspace through the Cloud Kavatica platform. And this is where you can analyze the large scale data sets using work workflows or notebook environments without having to download the data. But you're going to hear more about all that later. I just wanted to give everybody a, a big picture perspective. With that, allow me to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Engel. Dr. Engel is a world expert in her field and has uncovered associations between the clinical presentation and genetic basis of rare forms of structural birth defects that fall within the category of congenital cranial disinnervation disorders, which is the focus of her Kids First X01 project. Dr. Engel is Professor of Neurology and Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School, Investigator of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and Senior Associate of Neurology in the Department of Genetics at Boston Children's Hospital. That's a lot of affiliation, so hopefully I got it all. Um, but lastly, she was one of the first recipients of the Kids First X01 sequencing opportunity. So without further ado, Dr. Engel, let me hand you the screen. Thank you, Valerie, and all of you for this opportunity to describe how my lab's interpreting the Gabriella Miller Kids First whole genome sequences. These, um, these photos highlight the nuanced and coordinated ocular and facial movements that each of us makes and that really defines our species. 
And these movements are fundamental to our vision and social communication. My lab's expertise is in kind of a unique domain. We study human developmental disorders that perturb these ion face movements as a framework to really understand how neurons are specified and how cranial neural circuits are formed. As a group, these disorders are referred to as the congenital cranial disinnervation disorders or CCDDs. Many are Mendelian, and that allows us to use genetics to probe their etiologies. So our approach is generally as follows. We identify human congenital disorders of eye and face movement, define their genetic etiologies, study the developmental pathology and disease mechanism in vitro and in animal models, and in the process also study normal development. Before describing our kids' first work, I want to highlight how the CCDDs really provide a unique and powerful system to study neurodevelopment and neuroconnectivity. First, the anatomy of these circuits is isolated, straightforward, and tractable. Eye and face movements are accomplished through only four of our 12 cranial nerves, cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens, which innervate the extraocular muscles, and cranial nerve 7, which innervates facial muscles. The three bilaterally paired cranial nuclei that innervate the extraocular muscles are anatomically well-defined, and importantly, each contains only a few hundred motor neurons. Each nucleus then sends axons along unique trajectories to innervate their target extraocular muscles. The larger facial branchial nucleus contains four bilaterally paired subnuclei, each of which innervates multiple facial muscles. Mendelian disorders that perturb the development of these cranial motor neurons result in congenital human phenotypes that are lifelong, stereotypic, and visible to the examiner, such that we can simply look at an affected individual and predict the specific cranial nerve or even the branch of that nerve that has failed to develop correctly. We have DNA samples <clears throat> in our lab from over 15,000 individuals, and for many of our solved disorders, we have a really large number of independent mutational events. This means that when we discover a new genetic etiology for a disorder, we're really likely to get multiple alleles, which is the fastest and most definitive way to document causality. Finally, all higher vertebrates have 12 cranial nerves, and we find really remarkably consistent and precise translation between human, mouse, and zebrafish, allowing us to successfully model the CCDDs we identify. These animal models provide a really beautiful ability to visualize the developing cranial nuclei and nerves in three dimensions, allowing us to define the developmental pathologies underlying these disorders, and then study the mechanisms that perturb motor neuron formation and that disrupt these really specific fine-tuned axon targeting decisions. This wild type E15 mouse embryo highlights the developing facial nerve in green. It harbors an islet GFP reporter expressed under a motor neuron enhancer. The muscles and arteries have been stained red, and the embryo has been processed using a modified iDisco protocol. So using imaging of mutant mice, along with genetic, cellular, molecular, and biological studies, we've defined multiple genes harboring coding mutations in a variety of CCDDs, many of which are highlighted here in blue, and then we've gone on to study their developmental mechanisms. We found that the mutations we've identified perturb different stages of neuronal development. This first group includes mutations that alter cranial motor neuron identity or differentiation. As a result, the motor neuron dies or is respecified, thus failing to innervate the target muscle. The second group results from errors in the growth and guidance of cranial axons. These axons and uh, the cranial motor neurons are connected to the muscle via the cranial nerves, and if axons fail to reach the target muscle, they retract, followed by secondary death of the motor neuron. So while we continue to study the developmental mechanisms underlying the CCDDs that we've defined to date, we were very cognizant that a large proportion of our developmental cohort remained unsolved, and this led us to apply to join the Kids First initiative. We were very pleased to obtain a genome sequences from 899 individuals from 270 CCDD families through Kids First, and we complemented these with another 100 full genome sequences from the Broad Institute. These include simplex cases, as well as both small and large pedigrees with multiple distinct isolated as well as syndromic CCDD subtypes. Notably, the cohort is enriched for small dominant pedigrees that are really particularly challenging to solve. We imported the raw sequence from Baylor to the Broad Institute where the genomes were harmonized with reference samples in the NOMAD database and underwent alignment and variant calling. Julie and Paula in the lab are focused on interpreting the coding variants identified in these genomes. 
They prioritize the coding variants using conventional filters together with database and literature searches and co-segregation examinations when appropriate. And despite these steps, the candidate gene lists obviously remained large. So they're taking additional steps to establish pathogenicity. First, they search for additional alleles in our cohort, as well as through collaborations and online genetic dating services like Matchmaker Exchange. This has been quite successful for multiple pedigrees, many of which represent phenotypic expansions of known syndromic birth defects. We've already published multiple SALT cases and we're working on multiple more. They also interrogate our in-house cranial motor neuron single cell RNA-seq database. For variant analysis, as well as for our studies of normal development, we're constructing an encyclopedia of embryonic cranial motor neuron DNA elements, or our own ENCODE. Among these data, Matt Rose has generated single cell RNA sequence data for each cranial motor nucleus over its developmental period in mouse. Julie and Paola can then query this database to determine whether the gene that a variant alters is expressed in the right motor neuron cell type at the right age. Julie and Paola also conduct targeted in vitro assays as well as moderate throughput in vivo anatomic screens in differentiated stem cells and in zebrafish. In particular, because fish have conserved cranial nerve morphology, they're in, in the midst of testing a CRISPR-based F0 zebrafish screen to determine if human loss of function coding variants alter cranial nerve development. So with that brief overview of the CCDDs and our search for pathogenic coding variants, I want to shift the focus for the remainder of this talk to how Arthur and Lauren are interpreting the non-coding SNVs and indel variants in our whole genomes. As an aside, they're also working closely with Mike Tukowski and Harrison Brand to call structural variants, taking a similar approach to that which Harrison described in the Kids First May 2020 webinar. So while much of the non-coding DNA is believed to have function, there have been relatively, there's been relatively little success identifying non-coding Mendelian disorders beyond anecdotal examples, and the functional impact of those variants has proved difficult to establish. Therefore, while what I'm gonna to describe to you is clearly a work in progress, I think it's really important and timely, and I hope it may eventually help to inform other kids' first cohorts as well. So our approach to identify pathogenic non-coding variants began obviously with the whole genome sequencing and unsolved research participants. Joint SNV and indel calling generated a comprehensive list um, of high quality variant call set that included a whopping 50 million variants across the 270 pedigrees. These 50 million variants could fall in a gene promoter or anywhere along the non-coding DNA sequence, and it presented us with two major roadblocks. The first is just the search space. The non-coding sequence across the human genome is orders of magnitude larger than the coding sequence, creating issues with the sheer number of variants and the volume of DNA to analyze. And the second roadblock is interpretation. While we have established rubrics for interpreting coding mutations, no equivalent rubrics exist for non-coding mutations. So how do we proceed with interpreting non-coding variation? Similar to our interpretation of coding variants, we first hypothesize that these disorders result from rare and highly penetrant germline mutations. Therefore, we limited variants to only those that were conserved among higher vertebrates, that segregated correctly based on plausible modes of inheritance, and that were rare. These filters resulted in a significant reduction in search space. And while we're still calculating the number of resulting bioallelic variants, these filters resulted in a reduction to 26,000 unique monoallelic variants. At a mean of 101 variants per dominant pedigree, however, this still left us with far too many candidates to analyze. So to try to identify the most likely pathogenic variants among these, we decided to focus on variants that alter promoters and long-range cis regulatory elements. Cis regulatory DNA elements that we refer to as CREs typically contain transcription factor binding sites and control spatial temporal expression of their target gene. They include enhancers that activate target gene expression and silencers that repress it. So while CREs are extremely important for control of developmental gene expression, and many common trait loci identified through genome-wide association studies map to CREs, their role in Mendelian disorders has been underexplored. Notably, for a cis regulatory element to be active, typically the DNA element must be unwound from histones in order to interact with transcription factors. Importantly, this open state is often cell type specific and transient, especially during development. 
If a non coding variant alters the DNA of such a regulatory region, it can interfere with transcription factor binding and, in some cases, may cause a sequence to not open or to prematurely close. Because the effect of a CRE on gene expression may be limited, as I said, to a specific cell type and time point, a pathologic variant in a CRE would be anticipated to result in a more restricted phenotype than a loss of function variant in its target gene. So unfortunately, while chromatin accessibility data are available for some cell types, such data did not exist for developing cranial motor neurons. So our next step was to generate these data. And for this, we turned to the assay for transposase accessible chromatin using sequencing or ataxic. And we did so at a single cell level. Single cell ataxic leverages an enzyme called TN5, which selectively cuts open chromatin. And in the process, it attaches adapters that then serve as the substrate for downstream amplification and next generation sequencing. In this way, only cuttable or open DNA is sequenced. As a readout, if a regulatory element is open, you'll see a large pileup of sequencing reads as shown here, where the height of the peak corresponds to the openness of that sequence. And if an element is closed, there'll be little to no sequence aligned to that genomic position. Cranial motor neurons are quite rare, and in human, they actually develop around four to six weeks gestation. Therefore, they're effectively impossible to sample deeply in human embryos. Fortunately, as I mentioned, cranial motor neurons are highly conserved in higher vertebrates, and so we turned to embryonic mice. Arthur used the mouse harboring the motor neuron islet GFP reporter to microdissect, to microdissect, dissociate, and fax purify the cells of interest, as well as GFP negative cells surrounding the motor neurons as comparators. Once he had the purified cell populations in hand, he used a 10x workflow protocol that's very conceptually similar to droplet-based single-cell RNA sequencing. He performed the transposition reaction and then isolated nuclei and passed individual nuclei through the microfluidics device where they collided with barcoded droplets at some low frequency. The droplets were then pooled, amplified, sequenced, and went through quality control. Arthur collected about half a million cells after fax and generated high-quality chromatin accessibility profiles for about 85,000 single cells. As you see on the right, he generated single cell ataxic data from ocular motor trochlear, abducens, facial, hypoglossal, and spinal motor neurons and surrounding GFP negative cells. And he chose to do so at days E10 and a half and E11 and a half, when many of these motor neurons are born, establish their identities, and begin to extend axons. These data contribute to our embryonic cranial motor neuron ENCODE, and integration with RNA seq data is permitting us to identify cell type and temporal gene expression and the open closed state of regulatory elements, to identify novel master regulators and developmental pathways in cranial motor neuron subtype, subpopulations, and particularly relevant to CCDD genetics, it's helping us to analyze these non coding variant uh, pathogenicity in silico. So this is a display of the single cell attack seek high dimensional data set using UMAP. Each point is an individual cell and the distance between cells very roughly approximates the biological attack distance between them. The data sorts into multiple clusters and we have pseudo colored GFP negative surrounding cells in gray and the GFP positive motor neurons in green. You can see that these two populations separate into two different clusters quite well. Here I'm limiting the UMAP to GFP positive motor neurons, and I'm going to sequentially add each 10 and a half and E11 and a half motor neuron subgroup based on their dissection origin. So here are ocular motor and trochlear motor neurons at E10 and a half and E11 and a half, abducens at 10 and a half and 11 and a half, facial at 10 and a half, 11 and a half, hypoglossal at 10 and a half, 11 and a half, and finally spinal at 10 and a half and 11 and a half. As you can see, these two dates from E10 and a half and 11 and a half subtypes, they're overlapping or adjacent, forming clusters unique to that motor neuron subtype. And given our hypothesis that variants within ataxic peaks cause specific CCDDs, it's reassuring that each developmental cranial motor neuron subtype has a unique ataxic profile. Now I've limited the UMAP to GFP negative surrounding cells. So these are the profiles of the cells surrounding the ocular motor and trochlear motor neurons at E10 and a half, and E11 and a half surrounding abducens at 10 and a half, and 11 and a half surrounding facial at 10 and a half, 11 and a half hypoglossal at 10 and a half, and 11 and a half, and spinal at 10 and a half, and 11 and a half. The cells from the different dissections now tend to cluster together, suggesting that unlike the developing cranial motor neurons, 
the surrounding cells in the midbrain, hindbrain, and spinal cord have more similar ataxic profiles. Next is another level of quality control. For each distinct cl cluster, we can actually extract sequence information to identify the ataxic peaks that define it, and then determine if these peaks actually act as cranial motor neuron enhancers in vivo. As an example, we know that the vast majority of cells in this cluster come from ocular motor and trochlear dissections. We then turn to the VISTA Enhancer Browser from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. It provides images of enhancer activity of non-coding fragments that have been experimentally validated in vivo in E11.5 mouse embryos. We interrogated the database and found that a subset of the peaks highly specific for this cluster had been tested. Here is the LAC-Z enhancer activity data for one of these peaks, and it's very reassuring to see that the enhancer sequence drives reporter expression as predicted in the ocular motor nucleus and nerve. So following these and similar successes, we established collaboration with Dr. Len Panacchio's group at the Berkeley lab, and Arthur selected 35 untested putative enhancers for downstream experimental validation. Results are back for 24 of these 35, and we're really pleased that half and likely more have enhancer activity in the predicted cranial motor neuron pattern. Here's one of those 11 that again shows beautiful enhancement in the ocular motor nucleus and nerve. Among those candidates that Arthur sent to Lens Lab for in vivo validation, he chose a novel set of attack seek peaks that he predicted actually regulated our known CCDD genes. And to identify these new elements, he incorporated chromatin coaccessibility data and RNA-seq information to generate peak-to-gene enhancer predictions. In the most simplified form, he looked for correlations between peak accessibility and gene expression at the single cell level. This allowed him to make an informed guess as to what regulates known CCDD genes in specific motor neuron populations. Arthur then asked Lens Lab to validate the top enhancer candidates in vivo. Here is just one example of these experiments. We have previously reported that recessive FOX2A loss of function variants cause a specific CCDD that results from absence of ocular motor and trochlear motor neurons. FOX2A is a transcription factor known to specify ocular motor and trochlear identity, and our single cell RNA-seq data reveals its expression in these neurons and its later expression in facial motor neurons. Arthur and Lauren generated a peak to gene connectivity diagram with FOX2A here, and as you can see, there are many FOX2A regulatory candidates with varying correlation coefficients. The strongest predicted regulator is this one, which is embedded in the coding sequence of the CLPB gene more than 50 kb away. Looking at these accessibility profiles, you can see that this element is most highly specific, specific for the ocular motor, trochlear, and facial neurons consistent with a known FOX2B expression pattern. Highlighting this distal peak in blue and then zooming in on it, you can see that this putative regulatory element directly overlaps with and is adjacent to a highly conserved CLPB exon. This gene is not expressed in these motor neurons and coding mutations in it cause an unrelated disorder. So when Lens Lab hooked up the putative enhancer sequencer to a LACZ reporter, we found that the enhancer, whoops, sorry, we found that the enhancer is sufficient to drive LACZ expression in ocular motor, trochlear, and facial nuclei and nerves as well as in some lower cranial nerves that we hadn't sampled in a pattern that mimics FOX2A gene expression. So I think we would have been unlikely to consider this particular sequence as a FOX2A regulator if we didn't have the attack data. And it suggests that we can use this approach to identify new enhancers for known or candidate disease genes. So with high priority peaks called in each developing cranial motor neuron population and some confidence that these calls are high quality and meaningful, our next goal was to overlay the epigenomic data with our whole genome sequence variants. This would allow us to nominate plausible pathogenic candidates that fall in open regulatory regions in the right cell type at the right time. And we're taking three approaches to nominate these non-coding CCD variants. The first approach simply asks whether we can identify pathogenic variants in these newly identified elements that regulate known CCDD genes. While we've not found variants in the FOX2A enhancer I just shared with you, here is a second example. We've previously shown that heterozygous loss of function mutations in the transcription factor MAFB are a cause of Duane's retraction syndrome. MAFB is known to specify Abducens motor neuron identity, and in both individuals with Duane syndrome and in mice with loss of MAFB, uh, there is a lack of abducens motor neurons. 
This red vertical column highlights a novel 78.6 KB non-coding deletion that we identified in a proban with isolated Duane syndrome. This deletion encompasses multiple conserved non-coding regions that I've boxed here. The deletion itself is hundreds of KB away from the nearest genes, but among them is MAFB. Going back to our peak to gene predictions, here is MAFB, and you can see that the predicted interactions are quite long range. Here is the proband's deletion, which takes out four of the attack seat peaks predicted to regulate MAFB expression. This example is somewhat complicated because MAFB is actually open in all of our dissected populations, despite us knowing that it's only expressed, that fox 2 is, is only expressed in abducens, motor neurons, and surrounding cells. So we're not sure which of these peaks, if any, is acting as an abducens enhancer um, and whether this deletion solves this case. So this is a perfect case where obtaining additional enhancer activity data should be informative, and these experiments are currently underway at Berkeley. The second approach is to identify participant variants that overlap cranial motor neuron cis regulatory elements. This approach is agnostic to the target gene and takes advantage of the integration of our attack data directly with whole genome sequence data. Arthur and Lauren tell me that this is a little computationally heavy, but conceptually it's quite intuitive. Because we can predict clinically which cranial motor neuron population will be affected in each specific CCDD, we can group our pedigrees based on the affected cranial motor neurons and can then tabulate a simple intersect of filtered variants and the corresponding attack peaks that are open in the cell type of interest. This schematic demonstrates this logic. Zooming in again on this gene and the surrounding DNA, we've placed four hypothetical non-coding variants in this region identified in an individual who we say has Duane syndrome, the congenital eye movement disorder that results from maldevelopment of abducens motor neurons. Looking at E10.5 single cell attack data for this region from abducens, facial, and spinal motor neurons, you see that the gene promoter is open in abducens and facial and closed in spinal. You can also see that there are additional peaks in abducens and facial that fall in conserved regions supporting these as cis regulatory elements. Given that the participant has a disorder of abducens motor neuron development, we would choose variant one as the most likely pathogenic variant among these four because it falls in a cis regulatory element that is open in abducens at the correct time in development. By simply adding as a filter the accessible chromatin in the disease relevant cell type at the correct time in development, we're now left with approximately 5,300 plausible variants with a mean of 14 variants per monoallelic pedigree. To decide which peaks and which variants to study first, we're further prioritizing them based on whether multiple pedigrees harbor plausible candidates within a single given regulatory element. We identified 20 SNV multi-hit peaks shared among 38 unique pedigrees, 10 with dominant and 10 with recessive inheritance. It's notable that these 16 dominant pedigrees are roughly tenfold enriched for isolated non-syndromic cases which we might anticipate given that many regulatory elements confer cell type specific as opposed to constitutive effects. This is finally a tractable number of candidates for the team to interpret and potentially validate. I want you to note that this approach identified three pedigrees with congenital facial weakness that harbored SNVs in the same attack seek peak. And as I'll show you in a moment, we had already independently identified and experimentally validated these variants using other approaches. So finding these was very reassuring. So finally, our third approach is to predict the effects of these participant variants on chromatin accessibility. For this, Arthur and Lauren are turning to machine learning approaches. In addition to the location and distribution of peaks throughout our genome, we can extract information from the nucleotide sequencing sequences underlying the peaks as we did for the in vivo enhancer validation, but this time we use machine learning to predict whether variants might alter the openness of the region. Those that do would be considered stronger candidates. So Arthur and Lauren are using Basenji for this. Basenji uses convolutional neural networks to identify regulatory elements and synthesizes their content to make chromatin accessibility predictions. To train the model to the sequences of open regulatory regions, they input a subset of our experimental attack data for each specific cluster or each specific motor neuron subtype. The model then learns the sequences that predict chromatin accessibility across the genome for that specific set of motor neurons. They then validate the predictions using the remaining subset of data 
that we withheld from training. This is the validation of one downsampled replicate of facial motor neurons at E10.5. In this plot, each point represents a 128 base pair of bin, and the numerical values on each axis represent sequencing coverage. The x-axis is our experimentally measured sequence coverage for each bin used to train the neural network, and the y-axis is the sequence coverage across that bin as predicted by the neural network. You can see that this correlation is quite good, and based on this and other data, we can start to feel confident that we're making reasonable predictions for given sequences. We're also very fortunate to be able to test the calibration of our trained model against one set of functionally validated non-coding variants. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've identified within a linkage of a region of linkage in a lethic series of non-coding variants and non and excuse me, and nine unrelated pedigrees that disrupt facial motor neuron development and cause congenital facial weakness. Among these nine families, we identified two overlapping tandem duplications, and within the shared region of duplication, two clusters of non-coding SNVs and a regulatory region that we refer to as CRE2. In the interest of time, I obviously can't recreate the story, but the take home is that we have strong in vitro and in vivo experimental evidence that these non-coding variants cause this disorder. The small part of the story I want to share is the experimental effect of these variants on the open or closed state of CRE2. This is a TSNE plot of the attack seek data from wild type E10.5 facial motor neurons in which we're able to roughly distinguish different subpopulations. Specifically, if we look at sequencing coverage across each subpopulation, you can see that CRE2 is specifically accessible in this orange population, which are recently born facial motor neurons. We use CRISPR to introduce one of the human non-coding CRE2 SNVs into mice and then perform single cell attack seek on these mutant embryos as seen on the right. The second experiment has more cells that divide into more clusters. But what I simply want you to note is that CRE2 is now closed in all of them. This provides experimental evidence that this regulatory region is open in the right cell type at the right time in development and that this human disease causing variant closes it. So now, returning to our machine learning predictions, using Basenji, Arthur and Lauren performed in silico saturation mutagenesis and asked if it predicted that these human mutations would close the CRE2 regulate, regulatory region. So here you're looking at a 300 base pair window centered around CRE2. Each letter across the top represents the actual reference sequence, and at the bottom is a heat map representing each possible nucleotide at each position. The wild type allele at each position is denoted white, and the more blue the alternative allele, the more it's predicted to reduce chromatin accessibility, and the more red, the more it's predicted to increase it. These are three of the nucleotides altered in these affected individuals, and these are the specific substitutions. The red asterisks denote these substitutions in the heat map, and you see all three changes are blue. Thus, consistent with our experimental data, the neural network correctly predicts that these variants will close the chromatin. In general, neural net outputs are notoriously difficult to interpret, and so finding that this neural network is consistent with the mouse data again gives us confidence that the predictions may help us to prioritize novel variants in our whole genome sequence data set. Arthur and Lauren are now moving forward with integrating these machine learning variant effect predictions with our candidate variants. So to summarize our non-coding work, we've started with whole genome sequencing in unsolved patients with congenital cranial motor neuron disorders. We've identified accessible chromatin and disease relevant cranial motor neurons and overlaid this epigenomic data with our patient variants. This allows us to nominate plausible candidates. We then have integrated multiple layers of data to make predictions about the effects of these variants on chromatin accessibility. And in parallel, we are cross-checking our predictions against experimental enhancer activity data in vivo. Both our predictions and functional data feed into one another. So it's our hope that these approaches will allow us to successfully identify novel pathogenic non-coding etiologies of CCDDs, and that they will also generalize to other kids' first cohorts. So in closing, I want to acknowledge everyone who's contributed to the research and especially thank the Gabriella Miller Kids First program for making this research possible. Awesome. awesome. This was a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Engel.